Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video, and this video is going to be another installment in my Absolute Beginner Guide, the video series that I'm putting together that has a special focus on people who are brand new to Orbiter. This video is a direct continuation of the previous video, and that previous video was a direct continuation of the video before that. In this uh, part of the Absolute Beginner Guide, we are looking at the XR2 Ravenstar. We're learning how to use it as opposed to the standard Delta Glider. There are good reasons to use the XR2. Um, it has a LOX system, which is a liquid oxygen system that limits you to flights that are you know anywhere between seven days to a year or something around there. And that's kind of cool to have that extra layer of simulation that you don't get with the standard Delta Glider. Uh, the XR2 also has APU, which is a fuel that uh, also limits your flights. Uh, when you when you turn the APU on, it allows you to have a hydraulic system to open the nose cone, to close the nose cone, to open the radiator, have use of your surface controls and things like that. And when the APU runs out, then you no longer have use of those features. So you can't close the radiator. You can't open the air brake and things like that. So it's just another... Uh, simulation feature that adds a bit to the realism. So it's it's pretty fun to use the uh, Raven Star or Vanguard or one of the other vessels other than the standard Delta Glider. Now in the last couple videos we took off from KSC, got into orbit, and we did a rendezvous with the ISS. And this rendezvous was a little bit more difficult than the one that we did back in video number seven or eight. I don't remember what video number it was. Of the absolute beginner guide uh, what made this rendezvous a bit more difficult was that we have all the different perturbations enabled including you know solar radiation non-spherical gravity sources and that's the one that really makes things difficult and we have a gravity gradient torque enabled uh, i always have gravity gradient torque enabled i don't think that one really makes the flights very difficult but uh, it can make it can make docking a little bit more difficult because the gravity gradient torque adds in some additional uh, rotation and things like that that you don't have if that's off. But the one that really makes things tricky is the non-spherical gravity sources. Orbit MFD doesn't model non-spherical gravity sources, so you have to do all these sort of mental corrections in order to be able to rendezvous uh, when you have that enabled. But we are uh, here at the ISS, so let's go back to real time and let's bring up, let's actually go to this view so we have large MFDs. Let's bring up the dock MFD and switch over to nav one, which is the docking port uh, number three. You can see here IDS D-03. And we'll press HUD to copy that out to the HUD. And by pure coincidence, we are basically lined up with the docking corridor right now. Rotation. So let's translation. Uh, translate and rotate just to kind of slow things down a little bit. And we know that the up part of the corridor um, is here because this box, that additional line that you have there, Rotation. tells you where the up part is. Translation. Now we kind of already covered, you know, how to dock and everything in one of the earlier Absolute Beginner Guides videos. So I'll put a link in the description down below. If you haven't seen that one, then definitely go back and check that out. <clears throat> but the idea here, rotation, translation, slow things down a little bit. The idea is that we have two different types of movement that we have to work out in order to do the docking we have to get the rotation, which is you know the up, down, and left, right, and the roll portion. We have to get that worked out. And then we have to actually translate, which is to move laterally left and right, and to move up and down, and to move forward and backward. We have to get both of those, uh, that, that combination of movements rotation. worked out in order to complete the docking. One way we know that our role is correct is by looking at Doc MFD, and we can see this white triangle. If it's uh, if it's white, that means you're rolled upright. If it's if it's red, like let's roll off to the side a bit, that means you're 
you know, your roll too far one way or the other. So you want to see that white and you want to see it facing up. If it's facing down or left or right, then it's not in the right place. Technically, you can dock with this white triangle on any one of these corners, but to be correct, it needs to be in the up position. Translation. And now we want to translate. Uh, we want this plus sign or this crosshair to be in the center, and we want that red X to be in the center. Rotation. And we get the, we get this one, the crosshair, we get it lined up by using translation. And we get the red X uh, lined up by using rotation. rotation. So we want to rotate uh, sort of nose up a bit to bring that red X down. And then we're going to rotate a bit to the left to bring it closer to the center. And the whole time you're doing this, uh, especially if you have these different permutations enabled, you're going to have to fight with it constantly because things are still kind of rotating and moving. There is something that we can do to help out with that. Let me go back to a 0 0.1 for a moment. And this is actually realistic. I believe they, I believe they really do this in real space flight. If we bring up remote vessel control, we can select the ISS and we can basically send it a command. We can kind of radio over to the guys inside the ISS and say, okay, I'm 138 meters out. I'm getting ready to dock. Could you please stop the darn thing from rotating? And again, I think they actually really do that. Uh, you know, you know, not quite using that terminology, but they basically really do that in real space flight. So it's not cheating, it's not being lazy or anything, it's just that's the way things really are. So we're going to radio over to the ISS and we're going to say kill rotate. And that just sends a command to have it stop rotating uh, so that it's not constantly spinning. And that just makes our life a little bit easier. Translation. Rotation. So rotating a bit this way. And we need to rotation. rotate down a bit. And now we need to translate up a little bit and this way. And now I'm going to go inside the XR2 for a moment, start the APU, and we need to open the nose cone because it's currently closed. And we can do that up here. And the nose cone needs to be open for docking purposes because the docking port uh, collar is inside this area here so if the nose cones closed then um, technically we shouldn't be able to dock but I believe with orbiter even when the nose cones closed it actually lets you dock it shouldn't but it does once that's open close uh, turn off the APU so we don't waste that fuel and we'll come back over to this view so we can see this better and we can see clearly that our crosshair is down into the left so we need to Rotation. translate to the left and a bit down. When you get to this point, you want to be using control thrust more than regular, you know, just pressing 8, 2, 6, 9, all that, because your movements at this point need to be, you know, more pinpoint and precise. 75. Rotation. And I can see that we need to rotate just a little down and a little to the left. And you can see that X, which is now white, is right on the center. And it looks like we need to just put in a little bit of right uh, yaw because the X is slowly drifting, slowly drifting off center. Translation. And we're going to translate a bit more to the left because we have to bring that crosshair closer to the center. <clears throat> And, uh, yeah, just keep in mind with the XR2 that in order to open the nose cone, and, of course, this applies to the Vanguard as well, you have to have the APU on at least, you know, while you're opening it. And once it's open, then you can turn off the APU. But that's different than the standard Delta Glider. The standard Delta Glider, you know, you don't have to have APU running in order to use, in order to open and close things. That's just because it doesn't have that feature. 
but you can see everything's really well centered. Let's send one more kill rotation command to the ISS, closing in at about uh, a little over half meter a second. And things will probably drift a little bit, so we'll have to watch it. But we are pretty well set for a good dock. Let's see, we're drifting a bit, so let's put in a bit of right translation, a little bit of up translation. 15. And now we'll zero out those movements. But the X is centered and the crosshair centered. Nine. Slow down a little bit. Eight. Seven. Six. Just five meters to go. Five. And it looks like we're going to be able to drift the rest of the Four. distance without having to make any further corrections. So let's see what that looks Three. like from the outside. Two. One. Contact. And there it is. Contact with the ISS. So we can close this out now. Okay, so once we are docked to the ISS, uh, we are ready to, you know, do whatever it is that we want to do with our, you know, with our simulation. Now, I'm actually just going to undock right away and land back at KSC because the whole point of this particular part of the video series is just to show a little bit, a little bit about how to use uh, the XR2 and to kind of demonstrate some of those additional tools that we downloaded back you know with the burn time calculator and base sync and everything so let's uh, press F8 to get over the larger view and let's bring up one of our tools bring up base sync MFD and again hopefully you've already seen the video that I did where I explained you know how to download and install this MFD and how to basically how to use it uh, at least the basics of how to use it if you haven't seen that video please do check that out I'll put a link in the description of this video so that you can see that one. But what we want to do, since we're here at the ISS and we just want to turn around and go back home, we're going to target Cape Canaveral and we want to change uh, equator from, uh, we want to press the ED button to change this from equator to direct. Now there's something I'll mention here about uh, base sync MFD. I kind of pointed this out in the video that I did when I explained how to install this, but it's worth mentioning again. Notice here that it says surf, uh, target surface, even though I just put in target Cape Canaveral. But you'll notice when this changes, which is really irritating, the latitude and longitude do not change. So we still have the correct base targeted. And if you forget or if you don't see this, what you can do is just do it again, type target Cape Canaveral. And you'll notice here the longitude is 80.67 west and the latitude is 28.52 north. This doesn't matter what this says. If this says target surface, but this still has the correct latitude and longitude, then you can know that you are in fact targeting the right base. So let's just put in a different base as an example. Let's put in China Lake. So you'll notice here with China Lake targeted, our latitude and longitude are that number, are those numbers. But when we put in Cape Canaveral, we have 80.67 and 28.52. So just make a mental note of what the latitude and longitude are for the base that you have targeted. And then if you see this change at some point, just don't even worry about it. So in order to uh, land back at KSC, what we, would like, what we would like to do is we would like to undock from the ISS at a time when we are going to have a natural passage that comes very close to KSC. And we know by looking at uh, base sync down here, we can see eight orbits out of the future. On our current orbit, if we were to uh, undock now and just try to land, and there, by the way, you saw that change from Cape Canaveral to surface, but notice that our latitude and longitude have not changed. But if we tried to undock here and maybe do our deorbit burn here, which would be halfway around, and then we come around, we would pass 4,300 kilometers from KSC. That's okay. You can actually do that with the, the standard delta glider or 
the XR2 because it has such a large cross range that uh, you can you can cover that distance with no problem. But in order to do sort of a high speed uh, short reentry, we would like to pass as close to the base as possible. And we can see that if we go around another orbit, it's going to be 2,300 kilometers from KSC. If we go around another orbit yet, it's going to be 462, which is pretty good. But as we go forward, it gets worse. But it'll get worse and better, worse and better. I believe we can get even closer than 462. So let's just warp time forward now that we're docked here at the ISS. And what we're going to look for is down at the bottom of this list, we're just going to look for a number that's maybe, you know, just the lowest that we can get. If we can get down to just, you know, less than 100 kilometers, that would be ideal. Because that means we can pretty much go straight in to uh, KSC and have almost no cross range to worry about. So 430 there. The next best one's 800, but we can definitely beat that. Now we're seeing 700 is our best. We're just going to keep going forward. We're just going to leave it at 1,000. Things happen when you go above when you go above a thousand bad things happen when you go above a thousand so 800 kilometers out let's see what pops up on the list um, in the next trip around and if we watch uh, map MFD we can kind of see also you know what's happening why we're getting better in some and worse than the others now we're down to all the way out to 2,000 kilometers so clearly we can do better. That's 1,000 kilometers. And we're just going to keep going around until we get a good one there. That's pretty good down there. We may take that one, number 8. It's uh, 300 kilometers. If we don't see anything else pop up better than that, we'll go ahead and take that one. It's not It's not hugely, It's not not hugely. a huge improvement over the, th over the 400 kilometers that we saw, but it's a little bit better. Mm. Ah, there we go. We'll take that one, number eight. You can see how close that is. I was going to say uh, that one actually got worse. We saw that it went from 350 out to 400. And that's that uh, non-spherical gravity sources and working for you. So we're going to go all the way out to orbit number five. Now it's orbit number four. And that's just getting better and better as we go. So we'll undock from the ISS here in just a moment. That way we'll have plenty of time to separate from the ISS. Okay, we're now basically one orbit away. When this green line passes over top of this line here, then we're one orbit away. There we are. So back to real time. Let's undock. And we can undock using the keyboard shortcut Control D. So we'll do that rather than bothering with, uh, you know, going to the 2D cockpit or anything. So Control D. Undocking confirmed. Undocking confirmed. And before we forget, it's not a bad idea to op start the APU and close the nose cone. And we can do that with the keyboard shortcut Control A to start the APU. And we can close the nose cone with Control K. And it's not a bad idea to do that as soon as you undock because it's easy sometimes to forget. And we can also close the retro doors with control backslash. So those are closing up. And control A to uh, turn the APU back off. And what we can do also, just to show this, to make sure that we're ready for re-entry, and we don't need to worry about it yet because we haven't done the deorbit burn, but just to make sure that we're ready for re-entry, we can use this uh, MD, forget what this is called, multi-display something. It's not an MFD, it's a MD something, MDA I think it's called. So I think it's number nine. Warning, re-entry yeah. check failed. We can do uh, number nine to do a re-entry check. And we can see that we uh, failed the re-entry check because we still have the radiator deployed. And that's fine. We want the radiator deployed for now because we still have to go halfway around the planet uh, before we're even going to begin our deorbit burn. So there's no point at all in closing that for now. But it may not be a bad idea to leave this open 
uh, just so that we have that visual reminder of the fact that we still have the radiator deployed. So let's warp time forward. Let's go halfway around. Let's uh, no longer target the ISS and map MFD because we've made it here and we don't need it targeted anymore. So no orbit and target KSC. And as I've stated in a lot of videos, you know, one way we can know when to begin the deorbit burn is when we're halfway around. And there's a couple of different ways to know that. You can watch the distance readout, and as it count, counts up, that means we're getting farther away from the base. And then once we get exactly to the other side of the planet, that number, the distance to the base, will start counting down because we've gone halfway around and we're now getting closer. So that's one method to watch. Another one you can watch is this this orange line here in base sync MFD tells us where the base is at. So we know that we're halfway around when our orbit line here, which is this green line, is exactly opposite of that kind of orange line. Rotation. One thing I like to do Translation. when I'm uh, still, you know, halfway around, I like to put in a little bit of extra translation to kind of push myself away from the ISS. Because when it comes time to do the deorbit burn, it's possible that you could actually run through the ISS if you're not careful. So I'm going to put in a bit of eight here, which is kind of going to push me down relative to the ISS. And retrograde is going to be... Actually, let's find out. Let's just go to the retrograde position. So we can see how... When, when we do our deorbit burn, we can see how our vessel is going to be oriented as compared to the ISS. And you can see that, you know, we're, we're going to be burning this way, and the ISS is just right here. So it might help us to uh, do a little bit of lateral translation this way, sort of in toward the planet, so that when we do our deorbit burn, you know, we're well away from the ISS. So let's turn off that autopilot. Rotation. Translation. And with a little bit of uh, one, actually, am I doing that? No, that's the wrong one. With a little bit of three, I'm translating the vessel that way toward the planet. You can see the thrusters coming out this side. So it's pushing me away from the ISS that way. And I could also, you know, again, maybe a little bit of eight. So I'm, I'm down and away from the ISS. And that should be good enough. By the time I warp time forward, halfway around, those that little bit of engine thrust will have pushed me sufficiently far away from the ISS. So let's go to F8, bring up these larger panels. Go ahead and warp time forward, go halfway around the planet. If we want to also, as we're crossing this node or this node, and again, that's why we have this set to direct. Notice if I have it on equator, then these nodes are here and here, and these are the wrong positions. <clears throat> um, and that's also indicative here where it says PLC is zero. But if we change this from equator to direct, then we have the node here and here. And it tells us that if we want to bring our distance to the base down to zero, that we would require this much uh, burning with the full power of the main engines, which would be about three seconds, not quite three seconds. <clears throat> and we could do that here or here. It would actually be better, probably, to skip this node and do it over here, because when we come halfway around and we do our deorbit burn, this distance to the base is actually going to change, and I don't know if it's going to change in our favor or if it's going to get worse. But the reason it's going to change is because our velocity is going to change. When we do our deorbit burn, we're going to be slowing ourselves down just by a little bit, but that little bit is going to make a difference because the planet rotates, and the difference in the rotational speed as compared to our velocity will change how close we are uh, going to pass the base. So let's watch that happen when we get over here to the halfway point. Again, if we did want to do the base alignment, we would do it here or here. But we're going to skip that, watching the distance to KSC here. And when we're basically straight across, so somewhere over here, it's going to be time to do the deorbit burn. 
getting pretty close to that point. So as we get here to maybe 19.250, let's go ahead and go to the retrograde position. And again, it would be a little bit more fuel efficient if we did this not using the retrograde autopilot, but in this particular flight, we have plenty of fuel, so it's not too much of a concern. Speaking of fuel, after we finish our deorbit burn, it's actually re-entry check failed. It's actually not the worst idea in the world if you want to dump all your remaining main fuel. That will make your vessel lighter and it'll make uh, re-entry safer and I believe the real space shuttle does that for safety purposes. Uh, you don't have to, especially if you don't think you can handle a dead stick landing, then you might actually want to keep the main fuel so that you can uh, power up as needed. But we are halfway around. You can see this number is now counting down, so we're getting closer to the base with each passing second. Let's bring up orbit MFD. No target. Uh, projection ship, distance PDA, APA. And let's do about a 100 second burn, uh, or rather 100 dV. We can do that if we want by bringing up burn time calculator, switching over to the main engine, put in DV100 and burn. And that will lower the other side of our orbit down to around 40 kilometers or so. If we bring up orbit MFD, you can see the PEA on the other side is now uh, 20. That'll change slightly. But you'll notice too, as we did that, the distance to the base changed. In this case, it worked out in our favor so if we had done the a little bit of a base alignment there then it may have made things worse so that's why it's better to do the deorbit burn first then if you want when you cross this node over here as long as you're still high up enough in space you can do any last little bit of correction generally when your distance is this low it's not gonna it's not gonna help at all to uh to try to bring your off base distance down to zero because you're just the slightest amount of banking, just 1% or less, is going to have a very significant impact on your distance to the base. Okay, we are coming up on about 30 minutes again, so I'm going to go ahead and end the video here. And when we come back, we'll go ahead and warp time forward and uh, see if we can complete the whole landing in the next part of the video. If not, then we'll break it up into two parts, but we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Uh, like the video if you like the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video, subscribe to the channel if you like all this spacey content stuff and you want to be notified when I upload new Orbiter videos, and check the description down below for a link to my Facebook page. You can uh, like my Facebook fan page and there you'll be, uh, it's another way to stay notified of when I upload new Orbiter videos. And you can also see articles and other space related content, things that you don't get to see here on my YouTube channel. See you in the next video.